It was a house on a hill, and uh, and I'm hanging out over a retaining wall. Oh dear! My colleague forgot that he was my counterweight. Took a step off. Very quickly tried to step back on it, but it was it was late. all over. I went straight down, and as I'm looking down, it was so crazy. The slow motion world, you know, I, yeah. we've all been in that situation where you fall in. It's like this is gonna hurt. It's gonna suck. And I'm looking down, and there's bits of rebar sticking out. And I I pick my landing spot, and I realize that as soon as I land, I have to jump and get out of the mess that I was in. I land, I spring up and dive over the rebar and then roll down the hill like another 30, 40 feet. Jeez. Um, oh my it was pretty, Yeah, because the adrenaline's pumping at that point and I'm like, ah, oh, it's so dumb. I've ripped my pants, I got blood <laughs> on my shoes. I ended up tearing both my Achilles tendons. Didn't yeah, right. snap them, but like kind of turned yeah. them into cheese string. Yeah. So, Yikes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Efficient by Design podcast. Um, today, we have Dustin co-hosting with me, and we have our good friend, Craig Meadow. Um, so just to uh, be transparent, this is our second go at doing this. Yep. <laughs> We're just going to uh, post our mistakes here. So we we actually, four days ago, so it's Friday right now, on Monday, it was Monday, right? Yep, it was Monday. Monday morning, we, we did this. And uh, we went through a great episode. It was oh, great. So good. Got all wrapped up. And then uh, got it all finished. And then checked the equipment to realize that um, technical difficulty had taken place and record uh, <laughs> had not happened for our audio. So, as do my over. wife said, that was a really nice way for you to let me know that it sucked. So, <laughs> which is so it. not true. <laughs> so, not true. Um, so, having waited four days, we could have. Uh, Craig was very generous to be able, willing to come back and, um, you know, potentially even the next day. I'm like, I needed some time. We had actually plans to have a, do a few recordings this week. And um, I was like, you know what? I need, I need a little space and time to kind of cool down from the loss of that episode. <laughs> and also to just kind of give some space mentally because trying to do the same discussion the next day would have been mm -hmm. awkward. It's already going to be a little bit challenging, but at least there's enough time that I don't remember exactly how we said everything we said. I'm not gonna try to rehash it all yeah. identically, which is kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> and the other funny thing I was noticing is that this morning having you back in the shop again, because we haven't rubbed shoulders much for the last few years, but no. we used to yeah. on a fairly regular basis. And I feel like this, the previous interactions and the, you know, the bad news of the podcast not working and our texting back and forth and having you again this morning has kind of like, got back this level of comfort that we used to have. And there's been way more jesting and making fun yes. of each other. I think that's the first time I've heard you say jest. Jesting, yeah. yeah. It felt Joshing right. around. <laughs> so, so it was this morning, we're, we're making fun of his accent right away. So um, Craig is from the UK. Yeah. And we were thinking back to when we first got to know him, how we made fun of all the words you said wrong. Um, yeah. I was actually thinking one of the things we didn't cover on Monday was uh, how I met you guys. And it was actually... Christy's birthday. I showed up to the house and knocked oh. on the door. I was like, hey, I'm here for Christy's birthday. And Christy said, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that. Yeah. Um, oh, that's awesome. Because, yeah, we went to um, Randy Wheeler at the church and was like, hey, when we yeah. first came to Canada, we want to meet some young people. Oh, okay. yeah. And he introduced us to Amanda Brown. Yeah. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, that's come funny. over, come over for Christy's birthday. So I assumed I was going to Amanda's house. I didn't realize I was going to Christie's house. So, okay. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. But that was a that was a good time for you guys to come because there was lots of young families. That's right. Like just yeah. married, just starting to have kids. Yeah. yeah, we're all in the same age. Yeah. We were all, yeah. Okay, let's pump the brakes for a minute so, so we can catch these people up as to who you are. Yes. Um, so by way of introduction a little farther, Craig uh, is currently a designer and designer slash builder, designer 95% of the time, builder 5% maybe-ish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And previously, um, when we first got to know Craig, he was actually doing stucco and he's a tradesman and has done all kinds of building and became a licensed builder at one point in time and moved here from the UK. Um, so you are the husband of a lovely lady. Um, mm -hmm. Adele. Who I, we, I talked about this in the first podcast, which I, try, I have to try not to say that over and over. So I'm not gonna do that again. In the first podcast, though, we did mention how our wives are all jealous of your last name being Meadow. That's They've right. always talked about, oh, 
it's we're so jealous of Adele having married into this last name Meadow. It's just the prettiest last name you can. That's have. about all she got though was a last name. Oh. I mean, nothing else came with that. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, uh, was, so it's funny. See, and you've got two boys, two boys that are whole, how old right now? Uh, fifteen and sixteen. Fifteen and yeah. sixteen. And one other thing, just to compare to our first episode, you look a little bit different. I do. And I want to, I want to hear the story. So I'm not sure if the camera picks it up. You zoom in a little bit. He's got a little bit of a nick on his forehead. Yeah. And what happened? Because that wasn't there on Monday. No, uh, I got called in to help somebody pour some concrete on Tuesday. 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 Not Tuesday. 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 Um, you can decide. <laughs> that's right. Tuesday. Uh, was it? I think it was Tuesday. I was in my tool trailer, which is an awesomely organized piece of equipment. And uh, <laughs> I bent over to pick up something off the floor, which was oh, here deliberately is. on the floor um, <laughs> of the tool trailer. <laughs> and a uh, zip disk that goes on a grinder oh, had no. fallen a little bit forward on the on the shelf. And yeah. with my big forehead, I didn't see it. <laughs> Ouch. And just... <laughs> smoked it <laughs> luckily i was on my own in the tool trailer because the, the the air was blue and i was just <laughs> just livid it was like full smash and uh <laughs> was this in the, like before you'd started the pour is this during the pour is yeah after? it was kind of in the rushing around you know oh, in the heat goes, of the moment that's right you know oh. concrete goes right it's like we're ready and then the truck shows up and you realize we're not ready yeah <laughs> oh. and uh i'm just yeah totally smoked my head with the grinder and i'm like that's gonna bleed that's awesome <laughs> And uh, carried on just shouting and swearing at stuff. And If you're not yeah. bleeding when doing concrete, you're not doing concrete. That's right. I, oh. was, I was on a, I'm helping some guys with a, a foundation they're putting together right now down in, in Lower Town. And uh, they haven't done foundations before. They're like great framers. They, haven't, they don't have much experience with foundations. Right. And uh, so I'm kind of talking them through how my process of how I would do it. And, and they'll be starting to button up on Tuesday. 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 And uh, I said, give me a call when it's time to button up and I'll come down and kind of go through the paces with the method that I use to button up these types of forms and the things to be careful of. And, and we'll all start to bleed together because yeah. that's just the reality of, of form work is you get infected little cuts because it's just greasy, dirty yeah. slices and gashes that you get doing that. And there's always a tie at six feet, just, uh, just, yeah. a, just a eye level just <laughs> yeah. as you're peeking in to see whether i can get that in regards to your trailer i know that was a common uh, issue with our trailer we had one of the ramp door on it right and i think the entry into the when the door was down you know floor to ceiling the entry i think it was like five foot ten so it must have been perfect because if you had your hat on which is most of us most of the time and you didn't look up you brim your hat the brim of your hat would be down just a little bit you wouldn't see that little steel header and you'd just crack yourself mm. right in the forehead oftentimes your safety glasses are there which would cushion a bit which then the, like the nose pieces drive into your forehead that i remember bashing my head going to that trailer multiple times and it's usually when you're going into and out of a trailer you're walking slowly you're taking your time you really all, you know, <laughs> you're not in a rush ever no, no, never in a rush. especially during concrete yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're <laughs> running like someone needs something immediately yeah, yeah. <laughs> so were you were you did you have blood running down your face i didn't have blood running down my yeah. face but i i definitely knew that it was there and I touched it and it was a little lumpy and I was like, ah, and, and, uh, what did the guys say that you were working with? I was on my own. It was cause oh. I was the only, the reason I was there was because the, the homeowner was, uh, out of town Oh, and, okay. uh, he got a phone call from the concrete company said, Oh, we can fit you in in an hour. Was it just a little pad or something? Yeah. Just a, uh, it was a pad underneath a pad. It was a bit of a weird situation, but yeah, mm -hmm. it was just so it didn't require much in the way of finishing, but, mm -hmm. uh, neat things. Yeah. So it was just had to get I, done. Yeah. I had to get done. So it was a, a a meter and a half of concrete. So okay, and that's why he fitted it onto the back end of another truck. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So the reason to kind of have Craig in is because I want to kind of work through. It'll be kind of a broken up series, but a bit of a series of um, the process of building. So from design, which would yeah. kind of be your end of things, and you have a, a very unique perspective on it because you've been on the tools and been around the trade hands on for years beforehand. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Um, and then I want to step into probably, I'm, I'm trying to find a good guest to do, um, like the owner of a concrete plant. I'd love to talk to. So someone who owns like the ready mix down the road, I've been talking to them. And then I also want to talk to a designer at a lumber supply place. So I've got a friend of mine who is like, he designs floor systems and helps with trusses. And I like to talk to like a, a yard boss that does all the deliveries and loads the trucks and all that sort of thing. So. I'd love to kind of go through a bit of a series of the stages of a building and give a perspective from the other side of the counter 
to mm -hmm. what us tradesmen are familiar with our dealings with those people. And oftentimes like the, the on-site criticism that is given to everyone that is supplying us with plans, with material, with details. And, you know, it's a pretty regular thing on the job site that there is just a bunch of pissing and moaning about how the lumber didn't show up. What There's not enough studs. The design is stupid. There's not enough concrete. The forms were wrong. All of that belly aching that takes place. Here's a bit of a window into the other side yeah. of, uh, of that, that decision-making and maybe how we can better communicate with those people to have a smoother project. So that being the uh, kind of context for the discussion, we'll get to know you a little bit here first. So in regards to your background and your education, how you became a designer eventually, we'll get to that, but your trades background, um, kind of where did that begin? Um, and obviously you were in the UK at the time. Yeah. So where in the UK and what was your exposure to uh, trades? Yeah, so uh, I'm from a smallish town, I guess, uh, although I think it's a population of about 250,000 people, I think. If I remember correctly, it's called Wigan. So if you have uh, Manchester on the in inland inside of England, and then you've got Liverpool on the docks, Wigan's kind of dead center, a little bit north. Um, and that's so, yeah, that's where I was born and raised. And uh, at the age of 14, my mom came home on spring break and told me she got me a job. And, I, <laughs> and that was with uh, the building company uh, that I worked for, for on and off for six years. Um, with Alan and then uh, and, and he had a, a building company and he put me through an apprenticeship to be a plasterer is what I became to do but because of the, the nature of the company and the nature of the way things worked in the UK um, I did so many aspects of construction like from plastering to bricklaying to electrical to plumbing to framing um, so for, for context to North Americans, what is a plasterer? Cause that, oh, okay. that's a plasterer, a yeah. It's akin to a, a drywaller. Um, so, uh, in North America, we typically apply the drywall to the studs, uh, mud and tape the joints, the connections of the boards. And then that's the only area where the plaster yeah. goes, uh, it, plasterers are in the UK. Um, although taping and jointing is becoming a, a common thing in the UK, but, um, it's still, it's a veneered plaster. So you put on one eighth to sixteenth to three sixteenths of an inch of gypsum plaster that goes on, and then it gets trowelled up, similar to concrete. So over the entire wall. Over the entire wall, yeah, from the, from floor to ceiling, ceiling included. So um, why, why, like that? That seems like so much more work and so much more material, and you're probably using great big floats. No, you still apply it with a twelve inch trowel. You know, still apply it okay. a similar way. Um, th there are some newer tools that are out there now. That are, there's a couple of guys that I watch on YouTube that um, just to be interested in what they do, you know, like watching what I used to do. So um, compared between the two, like which one's better, would you say? I'm probably going to get a lot of hate from the UK on this one, but uh, <laughs> uh -oh. I feel the standard in North America for drywall finishing is higher than the standard hmm. typically on your average construction house than the plastering finish. So hmm. on a production house, production, you know, you go to a, so I worked on construction sites where a thousand of houses, not like 20 subdivisions, hmm. like thousands. Wow. Um, and uh, the standard that was expected in those subdivisions, I would say is less than the standard that's expected in a North American subdivision for the, the, mm -hmm. the, the wall finishing. Hmm. Um, Just because the volume is so high, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it would be a different look though too, right? Like it's more of a hand finish. Like there's going to be some texture and character to no, the walls. No, you can polish it to like a glass finish okay. to, to real smooth and you can, you can do really good work and you can bring that standard up. Right. But I think just due to, like you say, the production level, right. That, so I would take a house on my own, um, from stud and brickwork to finish dry. So I would hang the drywall myself, huh. um, plaster the boards in about a week and a half. Hmm. on my own like an entire i mean houses were much smaller in the uk mm -hmm. too right? right so that's also but um and is it a house or like a flat like an apartment it would be a house typically okay. um there would there, there would be some apartment but that's a different again another different trade of guy right hmm. so that's not so, quite the right thing so this is going to sound this is going to sound bad but from face at face value it sounds like you and they would use more material and do a worse job and take longer is that, that no so that that's the difference bad. it doesn't take longer Okay. So like I'm talking like, so I'm talking hanging the board and skimming the hot walls. So I could skim a room in three hours, four hours, right? 
and it's done. And then a day later, it's ready to paint. Oh, wow. Okay. Hmm. Where over here, we, we all know with drywalls, right? They come in, they do three hours worth of taping and go away for 24 hours, come back, yeah, yeah. do three hours worth of taping, go away for 24 hours, come back. So, you know what I mean? Sand and everything else. And yeah. that, so you've got that same process spread over four days. So yeah. you don't sand with plaster? No, you don't sand at okay, all. Okay, so you when you're done, when I'm done, when I finish, finished. Yeah, it's finished. You just gotta okay. wait for the the, the the plaster to dry. So it is quicker. It. it is quicker. Uh, it's a traditional, right? It's much more traditional. It's how plastering has been done since the dawn of plastering, right? What yeah. on daub was the original, where it's basically mud and manure and straw mixed mm. together and thrown against the wall and oh it's almost like a cob house a cob house exactly yeah. right so um that would be wattle and daub and then you'd go over it with a, a quick lime plaster is would would be the old way um but can you even put like hang paint pictures with a nail or? yeah so that's where it's a little bit on the superior side i guess is that it, the, your finished face is a little bit more durable right because it is right. a plastered finished <laughs> face it is a you do have that gypsum hard tacky face on it yeah um and a good plaster can make it look great. Hmm. I would just say the standard for your production home in the UK and the standard over here is it's different. Oh, just different. That's yep. right. Um, and there okay, must cool. be was... levels of finesse because I was working on a house in Alberta and they brought in a guy to do some some fancy mm -hmm. plastering work on the ceilings. And he did lots of like hand pattering, pa patterning yep. in the ceiling. And it was beautiful. But, yeah. you know, you, our general textured ceiling, you just spray it. That's right. Versus the plaster, they put a really neat handmade pattern into it. Yeah, <laughs> so in the UK, that would be referred to as Artexing, um, which oh, is okay. a different product, a slightly different trade. A lot of um, a lot of plasters can Artex, not many Artexes can plaster. Oh, okay. Um, so my, my house that we renovated years ago was built in the 70s, and it was a, like an Italian couple that built it. So it's probably laugh and so well as I say is the ceilings in that house we had like it was an older home so it was like there was a kitchen room there was like a dining room there's mm -hmm. a living room that's somewhat segregated each ceiling texture was different yeah one of them it looked like it had been sprayed and then that they had like stuck a nail in the center of the room and tied it to a trowel and done this cylindrical wipe oh, wow. of all the texture because you could see this like kind of circular where it had been troweled flat and you could yeah. it was still rough texture it was a traditional like popcorn ceiling in the kitchen. And in the dining room, when we moved in, it looked like the underside of a leaf, like veins of oh, a wow. leaf, like it had been scraped. I'm like, but I talked to the owners and originally it was like four inch hangy stalactite stuff. They'd like put mud on and like stuck a trowel and pulled it down. Yeah. And it was all hangy, like cave ceiling. Wow. It was crazy ceiling. And then some <laughs> other, you know, the person that owned it after the original owners, I think it scraped it sort of flat. Yeah. Um, but I, that's wow. crazy ceiling. I can't imagine the dust and mess that would have been stuck in all of that, that crazy yeah. stuff. But yeah, I know it's just a bizarre. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so, yeah. So that's plastering, plastering. So, and then there's, um, so what I did when I came to Canada would be, re uh, stucco, which in the, in Europe and the UK would be considered rendering. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's similar trowel applied finish, but it's usually sand and cement, um, and then with a finished coat on top of that. Right. Yeah. So then just to get back into your history a bit, so you worked for Albert? Al Alan. Alan, pardon Alan me. in the UK. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and this is where I did my apprenticeship. Um, and you said that's a full apprenticeship for a yeah. plaster, which isn't the case here. Like there's no journeyman drywallers, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah, as here, far as right? I know. And same for stucco. There's no qualification in stucco. Um, so that kind of thing. But no, in the UK, it's a it's a trade. It's a craft. It's um, four years, went to college. So they do apprenticeships a little bit different in the UK. Um, you attend school one day a week for four years. And the mm. other four days of the week, you're working on site for the company you work for. Mm -hmm. uh, so Wednesday was my day for school. So I'd work Monday, Tuesday, go to school Wednesday, work again Thursday, Friday. So I did that for uh, a little over uh, three years. I, I was able to finish my course a little sooner than four. And then because I had experience before I started my apprenticeship. So I started working with Alan at 14. I only actually officially started my apprenticeship at 18. Um, so those hours of, of experience Still, that's, could go. That feels early. Yeah. Well, in the, yeah, in the UK, um, you graduate high school at 16. Not anymore. I think they go up to grade 12 now. They go to 18. I think you graduated. It was just grade 10 when you graduated? 
Uh, it was actually year 11. You started a year earlier. So oh, okay. year 11 uh, is when you graduate high school. Huh. Um, so uh, Harry Potter, you know, Harry Potter, when they say they're, yeah. they're, they're in year seven, that's the first year of high school in the UK is year, oh, okay. year seven. Huh. You, yeah, we yeah. gotta you gotta relate everything for us with Harry Potter. That's right. I guess. That's what everybody knows England through <laughs> Harry Potter, right? We do live in castles. Um, every morning we catch a train to school. Yeah, yeah. So uh, no, it's yeah. So uh, at sixteen, I graduated high school at sixteen with awesome grades. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, and. That was the trade. I, I I fought so hard to not be in the trades because I, I I was like I don't want to be the the dumb kid that goes in the trades, right? Mm. Um, so I, I tried to go to college, um, and after six months, my college advisor and things sat me down and suggested that we should part ways. <laughs> uh, in which I in which I agreed. You got so, fired from yeah, college. I got fired from college. Um, so I. Uh, which so yeah, I, and then I went back into working in the trades. I did. A, I tried to. I built yachts for a year. Um, I went. I did a little bit of a welding apprenticeship. Hang on, you built yachts. That, yes. That that sounds like you, you did. You struggled in school, had to go in the trades, and you built yachts for a bit. Like, what does that mean? Because yachts are are not like. Well, we're landlocked here, so a yacht <laughs> sounds like sounds like you're building yeah so some prestigious. It, it was uh, it was a forty two foot. It was a Don class. 69, I think it was the name of the yacht. And it was a, it was a fiberglass hole, lead lines. So what did steel. you do on it? What was your job working on Everything it? Everything from the fiberglass in through to install in the kitchen. and Crazy. Yeah. Uh, it, was, awesome. it wasn't quite a full year, but yeah. Um, just before I met my wife, I did that. Um, did you like it? I did. But that company uh, moved to Scotland and said I could go with them. But uh, I chose not to. And yeah. then I met my wife, so it worked out good. Yeah, oh, nice. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, to so yacht building and then I did a little bit of a uh, welding apprenticeship uh, me, on and off like say I worked with Alan so Alan would call me in to do things at the weekend or whatever um, and in between those two jobs I worked with Alan but I just fought so hard against being in the trades because I really mm. wanted to be an architect in high school mm. but my careers advisor told me I was too dumb for that um, thank you yeah that's right because that's how they work right and <laughs> as my, you know back in the 90s right you know I, I have dyslexia so I was uh, I wasn't academically responsive to school, I guess. You know, that's probably mm -hmm. the best way. You know, just reading comprehension was difficult. Um, did they have any sort of, like, what, did you have somebody telling you, you have dyslexia, and then you go to school and you have a teacher who helps you through it? Did, was there any of that? Um, not, not on a one-to-one -one or in a discreet manner. Uh, so in, oh, it, was, no. <laughs> it was either you had two options. You could either do the regular stream with all the other kids or you could go to the special class. Thank and you. I, yeah, special I, being, class. Being six two at thirteen, similar to my my youngest son, who's now six four. Um, oh my gosh! And with long blonder, and you know, standing out from the rest of the crowd already. Yeah. The last thing I wanted to do was go to the special class. So mm -hmm. I was just, yeah. heck no, I'm not going to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, I stayed in the regular stream and failed. Didn't oh. fail, but didn't do great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting how that. I think you know we all were in high school and doing school through the 90s. And there definitely was like, you know, over there as it was here, a stigma to like being in trades. It's mm -hmm. like you can either have like a some kind of a legitimate career or you can be a manual laborer and end up in the trades. Mm -hmm. It's like this like catch all for all the low lives or the people who weren't yeah. intelligent enough or something, yeah. which is which is obviously incredibly unfortunate because the trades should be something that are highly, highly regarded and sought after and there's great potential there. And it's also interesting to, think through a lot of the guys I've worked with that socially don't present as terribly sharp mm -hmm. the way that they kind of conduct themselves, but you get them on the job site. And there's been people that I've been floored by their ability to manage people and build efficiently and, and harmonize structural and, and uh, architectural plans and build super fast. I mean, like this, this person is incredibly high IQ in this yep. domain, mm. but wouldn't present well in other areas. Like it's it's shocking. It is the, definitely the a, a weird situation that, like you say, that you know, if you fail school, you go into the trades, right? You know, that's kind of well. At least you can go and be yeah. a, a carpenter. At least you can go. Be, it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But when you get on site and realize the the mental arithmetic that carpenters do, and the, just mm -hmm. the yeah. the natural ability that they build because of the way that they learned those things that 
Mm -hmm. They don't even realize they're doing trigonometry. They don't even realize they're doing these, yeah. these complex things. Um, well, at the same time, there is also a reality that amongst the trades, you can have someone who is unskilled mm -hmm. and not of, of much, um, I was going to say value, that's the wrong word. Um, this does not have a, a high IQ or whatever, and they can be a laborer and and do really well. Like yeah. it can be a place that catches those people and gives them worthwhile work to do. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but that doesn't mean that that is an industry or a trade that you get into because you you're not able to uh, to do something that would would take would take more intelligence or something. Like you get every mix in the trades. Yeah, you know, every every sort will, can end up there, and it can be a really good good place to end up. Yeah, but it, definitely. It is. It is has to have that stigma of like, for me, it was because I wanted to do art, and so it's like, no, you're not going to do art. You're not going to ever make any money. So here's the thing: you could maybe like work as a carpenter. That's sort of artistic. Go do that. So at least for me, it was seen as um, not necessarily so much like you're too dumb to do anything else to do a trade. It actually. I think in my family was seen as something like this is a, a good career that you could do well at. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's something that you love to do something more artistic. You could apply that over here and you'll always have work. Mm -hmm. So it felt more like a, a safe bet. It's yeah. always a good fallback strategy yeah. for sure. Uh, that was the word. Yeah. Like, yeah, just go get that. It'll be a real nice fallback. Yeah. What do you, <laughs> fall back. Yeah. If your artistic endeavors don't pan out, you can always fall back into framing. It's yes. something we always need which, people to build houses, which is wise. And I'm super thankful that, you know, my parents encouraged me that way, even though construction ended up being something that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing. I love all the stuff that I learned. Like Craig, you mentioned the the things that you learn in carpentry or in construction. I I was terrible at math in mm -hmm. school and I did the special track, right? <laughs> I went on the special track with math and I think there was like two other people in the classroom with me. Yeah. <laughs> I just sat at my desk and felt doing terrible puzzles, about myself. So. Yeah, doing... <laughs> yeah, they'd bring me a lollipop every once in a while. Um, but I had a, such a hard time figuring out certain aspects of math. And I do remember, you know, looking at the tape measure and suddenly going, oh, one quarter, one eighth. Like it's suddenly I'm like, yeah. oh, fractions make sense. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I had the practical hands-on because it's just the way I, I learn that it started, all that stuff started to make sense. Yeah. And so I've, I've found it to be really a, an amazing place to learn tons of stuff. Like you mentioned, Luke, like just being able to work with people, being able to lead people, dealing with frustrations and people hurting themselves. Like the, yeah. th that environment itself leads you to have to learn so many different things. Mm -hmm. Oh, so many things. You, you got conflict uh, yep. resolution you got to figure out. You got to figure out how to rub against somebody that you don't rub it and would naturally rub against yeah. every day. You got to, the, the construction site is, would be a great place to do an, uh, like an, uh, like a study mm -hmm. of, of people. It's a pressure behavior. cooker. It's a pressure, like you say, it's a pressure yeah. cooker. Cause typically you're as, as the boss, you're there to make money. You're there to make sure the job gets done on a timely manner as an employee. You're there to just be there to get paid, you know? And you, yeah. and it's just that whole area of everybody trying to, create something with different agendas mm -hmm. to give the client and then end result and yeah. how yeah. that works out. And it's amazing that it does work out on a daily and basis. Sometimes it can be absolutely miserable. And mm -hmm. something can be miserable, but yeah. the product always seems to get to the end, right? You know what yeah. I mean? And uh, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say always, but usually, yeah. Usually. To just touch on the uh, measuring and tape measure and eighths and fractions, yeah. just to address that for a second. Um, as I've had, you know, over my career and hiring brand new green employees who've never read a tape before and mm -hmm. you, know, you call i want cut that to, to seven sixteenths or three eighths or whatever and they're like and they're on their tape and they're counting the mm -hmm. notches like this is bizarre this is so complicated and metric yeah. is so much simpler like just a little bit of defense to imperial um for those of you who just write it off at face value those of you in, in europe and everything um imperial system is actually incredibly simple in its it's building in that it's simply a unit of measurement divided in half, divided in half, divided in mm -hmm. half, divided in half. So it's like the simplest way to come up with, with a, a distance. It's like, here's, we'll say this is, mm -hmm. is well, you know, in this case, this, here's an inch. We're going to say this is an inch. And then we're going to divide it in half, half inch, divide it in half a quarter, divide it in half an eighth, in half a sixteenth, in half a thirty-second. Like it, it does make logical sense with where it comes from. Now, metric is simpler. It does make more sense. It's easier to work with. I would agree with that. But 
Imperial does does also make sense. However, 12 inches and a foot is dumb. Well, Craig, <laughs> you've, had, you've had the privilege of working in both. Yeah. yeah. So let's hear it. Ah, uh, I, I prefer uh, Imperial. I prefer oh. feet and inches. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Uh, so, it, man, it's so, so right in the, when I was in school and everything in school was in millimeters and centimeters, everything I did on the job site was in feet and inches. Oh, um, cause you were dealing with older guys typically, right. And okay. they, they, they were so, but I think now it's changed. And then when I, when, when I was 20 and I, uh, started my own business and started working on big construction sites. So my company that I worked for, Alan was a small builder working in private housing renovations, um, very little in the new building of structures, but typically renovating older structures. Um, when I switched from that to going into the new construction world, working on site and just banging out production houses. Everything on those, all the back end again in metric. Mm. Um, so, so what is, what is metric and imperial in the UK? What is the official? Uh, everything. So everything. The UK is metric. Yeah. Everything except for the miles on the road. So okay. So it's just miles on the road. Miles on metric, the road. Everything else. But everything else. Yeah. So over in Canada, where everything is. Yeah. Right. Imperial. Metric. Well, it's we're technically metric. We're technically metric. But I with guess. our neighbors to the south, we have to be. <laughs> Imperial, I think it's a hot mess. So yeah. we, so the reason Canada is in the position that it's in is that we are technically a metric country. Yeah. But the U.S., who was supposed to switch over, I think in the '70s, it was like this North American United decision to everyone go metric at this certain time. Yeah. Canada switches over, and the U.S. is like, ah, it's a pain in the neck. No thanks. So then Canada gets stuck, technically being metric, but having to deal with building supplies all made in Imperial. Yeah. So we kind of have to do and know both. What is the logic behind the uk having miles like were you guys imperial at one time and then switched yeah, over obviously, partly? yeah obviously we were imperial at one time yeah and then and miles over. just didn't change and miles just didn't change yeah um i know it's weird but uh that's bizarre yeah but everything on the construction side is imperial uh is metric sorry yeah um everything in schools taught metric everything except for so the weird thing so everything i did schooling academic wise so the uh, my school regular school then my plastering apprenticeship was all um, metric. Mm -hmm. And then I went and did welding and that was all Imperial. Really? Huh. Even in school. I was, that was with fractions. What? Yeah. So, you know, we were dealing with the thousands of an inch, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, it's a pain here because we build like almost exclusively, exclusively in Imperial. Yeah. But you go to school and everything's in metric. Yeah. It's so dumb. And then you deal with, um, uh, when, so it's funny. So being on the design side of things, everything, like you say, all my plans are in Imperial, except for site plans and elevations. They're all in, in metric, right? So, you know, we're, we're 523 meters above sea level, right? When we're dealing with our right, geodetic yeah, yeah. elevations, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, site plan were 1.5 meters setbacks from yep. property lines. The property lines are measured in, 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 in uh, met, Imperial uh, metric. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, no kidding. So, yeah, and then you, you switch over one page. And it reverts back to yeah. uh, oh, imperial so feet so, and inches. Okay. So you are a, is the term red seal apply? For? For plasterer. plasterer. Uh, no, they don't have a red seal. So it'd be a city and guild. Oh, yeah. It? See, yeah. I love city everything. Everything in the UK sounds so fancy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of like a trade. So it'd be a red, so the red seal is a trades qualification. The yeah. city and guilds is a similar kind of situation. It's a you have some kind of a crest at home or something. Yeah, I do actually. Uh, it was given oh. to me by the queen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're so cool. <laughs> well, um, now I will, <laughs> this is so dumb. But I was amazed to find out that the queen has all these trades that are super obscure that have been in the royal household doing this obscure thing for centuries like taking care of the geese right is a whole thing like the person's just an expert at the geese and someone about the silverware and yeah you know, all these different people working the, for the royal would, family there'd be legacy trades right so yeah. yeah like even being a butler is a trade right you know that kind of thing right yeah and that kind of so i mean obviously it's not as popular as it used to at be. first i was making fun of it right but then i thought man there's been one person studying the landscape and soil types of the royal family's property mm -hmm. for centuries. And they have all these old documents and, and layouts and maps. Like, that's cool. When you apprentice under that person, yeah. and that's how you pass knowledge. So, oh, oh, you know, so cool. imagine 
that's how knowledge was passed out. Even as far as engineers, architects, they were, you were apprenticed underneath, you know, it's only yeah. in the modern era that you now go to university and you get a, a qualification mm-hmm. and yeah. then you're qualified to do that job with no experience, you know, yeah, exactly. but typically, yeah. you know, the, traditionally you would apprentice even, even as far back as, um, the Romans and the Greeks and the, yeah. you know, Sparta, um, Sparta, right. You know, yeah. you, you were apprenticed underneath a, a soldier yeah. and he was the guy that taught you to do stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so that apprenticeship model works really well, you know, yeah. to, to yeah. specialize in, in an area, right? And you, you pass knowledge down and you hand knowledge down and, and it gets passed and passed them. So you're a member uh, of a guild? No. As a plasterer? What is the... Well, it's not, not a member of a guild. It's just that's the qualification as a city and guild qualification. So I guess you could, but so um, city and guild. And then I also did another one in drafting, city okay. and guild in drafting, too, which okay. would be considered a trade. Okay. Well, what brought you to Canada? Uh, so... I really liked the show, the show Due South, and I wanted to be a Mountie. I thought it was pretty cool, and I wanted a dog hey, called Deef and Baker. Most people, <laughs> <laughs> most people won't know that show. Do you remember watching the show Due no. South? I, I remember, remember the name watching of it the is... show. I liked it. I liked it. But it is a pretty lame Canadian well, comedy. Yeah. You know it is. <laughs> you're, about you're about defending... a Mountie who ends yeah. up in the States, which is odd. Yeah, so there you go. the Mountie who ends up in the States, and of course... What's a Mountie? Okay. So in Canada, yeah, this is confusing. You have a federal police force, Royal Canadian, Mount, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The RCMP. I was super disappointed they don't wear red uniforms every day. No, they don't. <laughs> and it, you know, you have in the history of it, you have, you know, a, a police force that was assigned to things like during the gold rush, you would have Mounties go up there and they'd be stationed. Mm-hmm. and they would oversee fur trade and different things. And so they were kind of a federal police force, and they always were on horseback, and they were always perceived in a cliche, stereotypical way as super tough. And always they get could, their man. They always get their man, and they can survive in the wilderness, Canadian wilderness mm-hmm. on their own. And so there was this mystique about Mounties that they are. But, of course, the mystique wears off as you look at, you know, the horrible history of, colonialism and all that but we won't get into that (laughs) but a mountie so in canada the royal canadian mounted police would be classified as a mountie and the show due south was a hilarious canadian humor show about a mountie living in the states and him being very stereotypical canadian yeah straight stoic stoic straight up and back yeah and it was uh, admittedly it was pretty funny i used to watch it but it's fascinating to see somebody come from overseas who's watched that show i'm so surprised that they even aired the yeah, show yeah and you watched it and you're like okay canada is my place a lot of a lot of our tv from when i was a teenager was from north america a lot of it was <laughs> north american and australian i guess um because typically uk didn't really produce shows for those <laughs> it was either kids you know you had oh. your kids shows and then you had your adult shows and that <laughs> middle ground got missed Huh. So all our shows were like North American and and Australian and things like that. Okay, so you watched that space. show. Yeah, got an idea of Canada. That's right. And then I met my wife at eighteen, and um, she also wanted to move to Canada because she'd watched another show uh, <laughs> uh, by Michael Palin as uh, Around the World in Eighty Days, and he went oh, yeah. uh, on the Rocky Mountaineer glass top train and saw. It, and she's like, I would really love to live there where the mountains are. Yeah, and we kind of explained that to each other and thought, well, this is what we're going to do once we finally got together permanently. And then, um, have you done the train? No, (laughs) I've been here almost 20 years and not done it, but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So that we both decided that was going to happen and we, 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 we wanted to do that and it didn't happen exactly the way we wanted to. Um, I kept looking we kept looking into it. We couldn't figure out how to make it work and make it happen. And then, uh, there's a lot of hoops to jump through you'd said and then it got easy all of a sudden yeah that's right so we we have you have to have a job to to come over right you got to have a mm. job uh, there's there's a bunch of avenues and uh we just I, every time i'd look on the the job listings i just see stu, stucco uh mason stucco mason i'm like oh, i'm not a stucco mason i have no even no idea what mm. a stucco mason is um and oh. then we kind of let it go we bought a house we got married we bought a house through a few turn of events, we ended up kind of realizing that this this might happen again. And I got in contact with a guy over here that was 
uh, looking for tradesmen, looking for plasterers to, to do stucco. And then I found out that stucco was just rendering. Mm. Um, and then <laughs> I was over here in 2004, August of 2004, uh, to check everything out. And then uh, February 2005, we, we came here permanently. Mm. Um, it was pretty quick and quick turnaround. And then we did what was called the provincial nominee program. So uh, nominating you to come over here or a family member nominating you to come over yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, the province recognized a, a missing oh. uh, labor yeah. force. Mm. A missing trade, and then so they they nominated us. So oh, we, cool. were, we were we were uh, nominated provincial nominee, and we we did that. And that took it should only take six months because it's a, supposed to be an emergency thing. But that ended up taking almost two years. Wow. Mm. Yeah, and um, we ended up in being in the paper because uh, a friend of ours at the church, a mutual friend of ours at the church, uh, wrote a newsletter about wrote a news story about how. Uh, we were going to have to leave the country, and we didn't have this paperwork back in. Back in, yeah. um, and then the local MLA got involved, and yeah, and then eventually it all worked out, though. So, so are you, I assume you're a Canadian citizen. Now. I am now. Yes. And when you do that, because I don't know anything about it, when you become a Canadian citizen, do you have to forfeit any other citizenship? Nope. No, because oh, okay. it's all in the Commonwealth, right? So we're still British citizens as so well as. I've had family who've moved to the states, and they have to renounce different. their. Yeah, they have to renounce it, yeah. and it's this whole terrible thing. Yeah. So okay, so you're dual citizen. Yes. Sweet, and your kids will also be. They can be. We haven't applied for dual citizenship for them at this point, uh, but yeah. we, it's just an application that we would have to do. Yeah. Because yeah. The first generation. Huh. Okay. So. <laughs> So then you ended up working in Stucco and ended up working for a mutual friend of ours, and Albert. Named Albert. Yeah. Um, he did, he ended up doing a lot of the stucco on the houses that we had built. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of following us at times. And this was somewhat early on in our um, relationship, getting to know you. Like, well, this is almost like 20 years ago. Yeah, 2005, 2006. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just one funny note to make. It was a, it was a funny thing because it seemed like every month or two we'd cross paths and you'd you'd have a bit of a limp on yeah and we're like hey craig what what happened and like ah oh, i fell off the scaffolding again <laughs> it was this kind of <laughs> running joke that that you would you would be hustling and kind of pushing the boundaries of of uh yeah. of the job and you did you take a fall and and then you'd walk it off most of the time which is unreal yeah i'm pretty Agile and bouncy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah. yeah, and 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 usually would want to, if you know, if it took longer to set up scaffolding to do the project, I'd find a quicker way to do it, mm -hmm. and usually meant reaching further than I should and telling someone to stand in a certain place so you yeah, can go stand somewhere else. That was else. that was the last accident I had where I fell sixteen feet, um, oh my and that word. pretty much changed my whole career. Hmm. So um, when you hit the ground after sixteen feet. Do you stay still or you no, bounce up? I was pretty, it was actually another agile situation. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it was a house on a hill and uh, and I'm hanging out over a retaining wall. Oh dear. To try and get the last bit of parapet wall finished. And uh, my colleague forgot that he was my counterweight and took a step off. I very quickly it, tried to step back on it, but it was, it was all over. And um I went straight down and as I'm looking down, it was so crazy, the slow motion world, you know, I, yeah. we've all been in that situation where you fall in, it's like, this is gonna hurt, it's gonna suck. And I'm looking down and there's bits of rebar sticking up and oh, garbage on the floor. And I, I pick my landing spot and I realize that as soon as I land, I have to jump and get out of the mess that I was in. Mm -hmm. So I, I land, I spring up and dive over the rebar and then roll down the hill like another 30, 40 feet. Jeez. Um, oh my it was pretty, Yeah. And uh immediately turned around and shut it up to everybody. Finish the wall. Um Yeah, you gotta finish the wall. That's right. Because the adrenaline's pumping at that point, and I'm like, oh, it's so dumb. I've ripped my pants, I got blood <laughs> on my shoes. Um and I'm walking around shouting and you know, uh and telling everybody to do things. And then, uh, so because I would never ask anybody to do anything that I wasn't willing to do, right? It wasn't like I would tell somebody to go up there. I would be the guy to go up there. You were but, kind of lead hand on the crew at the time. Uh, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Not, I wouldn't say lead. Yeah, I was one of the higher guys. You know what yeah. I mean? So um, those other guys that worked underneath me and underneath others and things like that. So you know, I'm telling everybody to kind of finish up why I think I'm going to go clean off the blood off my shins and mm -hmm. kind of. But you, you didn't notice that things were like either torn or broken or yeah anything. so uh, like say and i was like okay we'll have coffee because you know i'm 
adrenaline's pumping. I need a minute to calm myself down before we get on, finish the wall. We'll get back at it in a, you know, take 15. And then while we were sat around the, the having coffee on buckets, upturned buckets, I was like, man, this is, this is hurting. <laughs> What's uh, hurting? Where's like, hurting? Oh my. So I taught, I ended up tearing both my Achilles tendons because so what saved my back is, I guess, uh, my agility, as the yes. doctor said, uh, although I weigh like 300 pounds. Um, <laughs> Actually, at that time, that was so. I don't know if you guys remember. I lost a whole bunch of yeah, weight, yeah, yeah. right? Like, um, and I got down to two hundred five, which was ridiculously mm. skinny. So that was right in that kind of period. So I was mm. lighter than. So that probably saved my back as well. Um, anyway, so I fell with my feet pointing down, and as soon as you, I guess your balls of your feet, as soon as they touch the ground, that engages your calves, mm. and I was able to absorb the impact with my knees and calves, which wow. tore. Like it didn't yeah, right. snap them, but like kind of turned yeah. them into cheese string. Yeah. So, Yikes. Uh, I realized that it was getting painful. So uh, I got driven to my, my Jeep, my old, my old white Jeep. I don't mm -hmm. even remember my old white Jeep, mm -hmm. uh, which is a standard. So oh, I dropped yeah. off in that and I was like, okay, I'll drive myself to the hospital. So I drove myself to trying to shift gear with torn ligament. Oh, it was brutal. Yeah. And, uh, this is a so going off tangent here, but this is a, such a stupid story. <laughs> so I'm in the hospital, bleeding from the shins, can barely move, holding just about holding together the tears and crying to my mom and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a nurse comes to me and said, uh, how, "How many hours did you put on your parking?" I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> stupid. Part. It's like you, you, like it was right when the whole parking came yeah, in. Yeah. They were being really really strict with it and i had to go and re-update my parking no. and so i'm dragging myself up the hallway no to go and do my parking and uh i put, come out of the door and this woman pulled in with a minivan and stopped right in front of me i was like i gotta go around that now and it was just just that was the worst <laughs> yeah. thing. it was like it's adding six feet to my journey and yeah. that's yeah. brutal <laughs> yeah. so that's anyway, yeah. terrible and then i drove myself home again driving standard with it oh, it was brutal pushing on with your heels on the but gas yeah, just the... just it was so bad it was so <laughs> bad just driving that stupid old jeep when you when you talked about like the slow motion moment mm -hmm. as you fall and how everyone knows that like I've taken very very few falls but there is one that was exactly that situation for me too and so when you and I were working together in Peachland mm -hmm. and we were putting we had, had a first floor of this fourplex built first floor walls are up we had rimboard around the perimeter of the walls and you were standing up eye joists mm -hmm. and there was like these eye joists are probably like twenty two feet long and you know to make the span of the the floor and i was at the outside corner nailing rim board together and there was like you know nine foot wall below me and like a foot or two of foundation so it's about 12 feet to the ground and you were standing up all these eye joists in a pile I think there's like four or five of them leaned up against the wall and they're like on the ground leaning against the rim board and then sticking up another like nine ten feet and i'd never stack them in a way where they would slide no never, never. <laughs> and here i am at the corner nailing rim board together and the vibration of me banging away these things start to slide and i remember hearing this funny noise this <laughs> I'm, I'm nailing away and then out of nowhere this stack of four 22 foot eye joists hit me right on the back of my head wow. and i'm i'm standing in the outside corner so it just snapped my head and they just carried straight on past me mm -hmm. but it just threw my my body off the wall and i had this split second to just take in my landing spot yeah. same same sort of thing i've got this like everything slows down and Eternity you're like pile of lumber yeah. pile of garbage another pile of lumber there's like an open spot of soil right there and you just kind of throw your body yeah <laughs> in that direction you can influence it enough to like kind of push your momentum affect your momentum bit. feet over here and yeah <laughs> and so i remember being like whack and just rings my bell didn't knock me out fortunately and i got thrown off the building but i kind of launched myself in that direction kind of land like a cat mm and absorb the landing well enough to not really hurt anything and because i wasn't i wasn't expecting an impact i was completely loose mm. right which is they say like oftentimes is why you know people who are drunk in car accidents don't get hurt because they're not tensed up for the impact yeah. they're just loose and so maybe it was a similar situation where i got hit and uh, yeah stuck the landing stood up you know pick up all the nails off the ground put them back in my tool belt try and find my hat and I'm like oh, neck feels a little loose but i'm okay and back to work but that that moment of like things slowing down yeah this like weird superhero moment that we have it's bizarre to me like that adrenaline is just waiting in the background and, and like that yeah. it's there and you go into this like high like that this how that works chemically i'd, I'd love to understand because yeah. that's that bizarre it's like um 
Have you seen the cartoon Over the Edge? Over the Hedge. Not Edge. Oh, over yeah. the Hedge. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. there's the, the squirrel that's just manic. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and then doesn't he drink like a Red Bull? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and all of a sudden he's got like, everything's in slow motion. Yeah. And it's kind of like that situation. Yeah. But like, you just, you got this, it almost feels like an eternity to, okay, this is going to, and which sucks because you do realize that this is going to hurt. I got to figure mm. a way of this to minimize yeah. the, the pain in this. Um, but yeah. And that accident actually is what changed laid up for eight weeks before I could start physio. Um, and then on the day that I went back to work for Albert, um, I quit. It was, mm. I, I, so I didn't quit and finish the job. I quit and told him this is my last season. Mm. So I gave him months. It was like at the end of the season, I'm done. Cause I didn't mm. want to walk away from, you know, Albert and I, we'd had a great relationship. Didn't want to walk away from mm -hmm. a, a good friendship. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just knew that something had to change. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when I, I, I quit that. And You'd been doing a bit of design on the side during this time? No, I hadn't done any design other than my own house, yeah. um, which was terrible. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, so I, I built Craig's house back in okay, 2007-ish. Seven yeah. Well, so we, yeah. Were, we were both involved. Yeah. I helped Craig at the beginning. Right. Because I had left Acrobus, and so I was doing odd jobs. And so I was helping Craig, and yep. it was just terribly cold mm -hmm. yeah. and it was just tarp city over there it was the coldest winter on record at that point it was crazy mm -hmm. um which is funny and just as you mentioned like when we met each other we were all in the same kind of family just got married kind mm -hmm. of situation and building houses and building houses kids, we'd yeah. all you guys had just built your two houses and yeah which, you helped me on my house i helped name, a little bit with luke's so. your name's written on the studs behind the drywall in that it? house that's cool i know the, i'm mad the tile it. on the floor i did the tile on the entryway floor yes things like that <laughs> yeah um, and I, I i threw my arm out on your your house mm. I, my my lead a guy who became my lead hand chad uh one more I, I used to pride myself in having a cannon i could throw his a country mile and one morning before country work mile. yeah <laughs> whatever that is. so i can throw this pig skin over that mountain over there <laughs> <laughs> and so i i remember one morning i'm like i'm gonna bean chad and I made a snowball and and unloaded and i i was cold and tore my shoulder and i haven't been able to throw since it's, yeah. so i wrecked my shoulder and i, I remember cool. like yeah tarps like crazy and heaters because that winter was so cold um yeah, so yeah, we, uh, like Dustin and I got all the footings formed in that place, done. And then the temperature just plummeted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we ended up having to pull out all the farming Ugh. and re-excavate, pull all the clay out and put oh. in drain rock. So, Right. Such a huge Because you guys built a whole place. That whole place is sat on a big pit of drain rock, right? Yeah, because so, that's the old James Lake that's area. Right. And there's like the high, kind of higher so, water table. I wonder and, why they call it a lake. <laughs> um, <laughs> It used Let's to build be a, all these houses in a lake. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, you designed your place. I designed my place. Yeah. Um, that was the first design I'd done since I did the drafting course back when, just after I got married. Mm -hmm. So, it wasn't too long between, actually, at that point. But anyway, and then I hadn't done anything then until I, start, I, I, I finished with Albert and I just decided to become a handyman, kind of open up my own business and had a business at that point for, you know, seven years eight years well nine years it's almost um so i opened up my business and i ended up working with a bunch of friends um doing carpentry and doing mm -hmm. framing and and to like, the point that you actually became a licensed builder and did start to finish yeah so some I, custom stuff right the guy that i ended up just working with as a sub uh nick we got together and we we uh we got building license together in the company and, and uh yeah we became we were licensed builders back then and yeah so then i did start we offering design right for 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 the new builds that we would do which was you know a steep learning curve to all of a sudden mm -hmm. start huh. using this craft that i hadn't done since and how are you school. how are you doing that design like that wasn't freehand stuff like what programs are you running or yeah so at that point i was using autocad um mm -hmm. which was which is a pretty standard mm -hmm. uh two-dimensional uh design package mm -hmm. um it's quite industry standard like typically when you transfer it's fun, so funny <laughs> It's an industry standard in that when you transfer a file from another designer to another designer, you transfer it in the AutoCAD file format. Mm -hmm. The chances are, though, I don't work in AutoCAD anymore, and the other designer probably doesn't work in AutoCAD more. And there's other programs on that. On yeah, that, but that's become the file transferring format. I'm sure there's another mm. equivalent in another trait. Like yeah, it's well, nobody does that design. anymore. But yeah. we, we'll transfer it in whatever it is, right? So. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I started in AutoCAD, and now I, but now I work in a program called SketchUp, which is yeah. kind of, uh, it's, it's getting a lot of traction because it, it started out as a free program done mm -hmm. by Google yeah. um, as, a mo as a 3D modeling program, and, and everybody kind of, it was like um, the, the paint shop the paint uh, paintbrush you know paintbrush you get with windows is kind of like yeah. the, the paintbrush of the graphic design okay. world you know what i mean it's like yeah. oh man you're using sketchup but it's actually a really powerful program and actually mm -hmm. uh you can do so much with it and and you know and it's actually getting a lot of traction and it's actually a really mm -hmm. good program yeah so right. um so then when did you kind of step into like design kind of a full time yeah so um my, me and nick my ex-partner uh we we decided to, to sep go separate ways he wanted to go into a different aspect of the of building new homes into the the spec houses you know mm -hmm. uh, building houses on speculation and I, I i was i wanted to stay more in the custom build you know let somebody else pay the bills so i don't have to front the money mm -hmm. um so we decided to to go our separate ways and uh he left the company i i kept the company for I think another two years after that, uh, built a couple of houses, um, and then I decided that. Well, it, it was a bit of a bit of a weird time. So just after the separation of Nick and I, I built my own house. Um, right around the same time, Brad built his house. Mm. We, we were all building, and that pretty much wiped me out. It took six months off, built a house, um, mm. just building your own house just emotionally destroys you right so mm -hmm. and i did that and then i went into building right out of after, after building because you know i've just taken six months off of work and paid out hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a house mm -hmm. i need to work immediately so i went yeah. and jumped straight into working on other projects which in hindsight i probably should have taken some time but i didn't mm -hmm. um i framed a project for somebody and then i built a custom build carriage house then a custom built house and uh the stress level just got to me where I was like, man, this is, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. It was just brutal. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I shut that company down, basically. Long story mm -hmm. short, I decided I can't, I don't want to do. Yeah. And I wanted to, uh, my wife at the time worked part time. And she's like, well, okay, well, why don't we switch our job roles? Why don't the boys are now of an age where they don't need the mom anymore. They need their dad. Mm -hmm. Why don't you be a not a stay at home dad, but you, we figure something out that you can work less hours and be at home mm. and I'll go out and get full time work. So she did. So she mm. went out and got a full time job. Uh, and I, wow. and I work from home. Uh, and that's what, so I just, oh, well, let's do the drafting, you know, cause I'd already had, so within the, so within the construction, I was doing drafting work for other people. Cause mm -hmm. you know, I, that was part of my thing now that I did. Um, so I just shut the construction side of the company down and, and, and started up my own drafting company. Mm. um and got super busy super quick wow <laughs> so uh yeah Great. but i worked right from home worked right from my my own you know across the hallway from my bedroom i was my office yeah. and mm -hmm. i did that yeah so so in, in regards to the drafting getting into that i mean having the background of having been on the tools mm -hmm. for so many years and and that, i mean your perspective on on how to design for the benefit of the people that are going to be reading your plans is going to be unique to the guy who's just gone through school. Like I think of houses that I I've built and it seems so obvious that whoever did the plans, unless there was like constraints that the lot gave, yeah, you know, that there would be like, like make the jogs in the foundation two feet. Yeah. Just, just please just let's don't give me this like 15 inch jog, 12 inch jog in the foundation. These are pain in the neck. So, you know, it, it seemed apparent oftentimes that people, you know, they're what well, looks good on paper, they don't realize the reality of the implications in the real world, and I've got to build it. So for you to have that that foreknowledge of like, here's how I can build and build to the benefit of the people who are actually be swinging the hammers and putting this thing together. Yeah. And the benefit of like the efficiency of the home where the plumbing and heating runs are going to go like that. That's an insight that you have that I'm assuming you've built into how you design your homes. That's right. Yeah, definitely. I try to stick what you say within that two feet, right? We, you know, as a guy, as guys that have built foundation walls and farms, right? We know that they come in two foot segments, right? Mm -hmm. And a corner is two feet, right? So if you have a jug that's not two feet, all of a sudden now we're hand making corners, we're making mm -hmm. corners on site, we're wasting material because, you know, you just paid, well, back then it wasn't quite that, but now it's like 60 bucks for a sheet of three quarter inch plywood yep. that's trash. 
Yeah. Once mm-hmm. you've cut it up, chopped it up, drilled holes in it, you can't use it for throw it away. It's yeah. throw it away, right? Um, it's no good on another house because the chances of them having the same jog, is, you know, it's just, so yeah. Yeah. it just becomes so. Um, yeah, definitely trying to incorporate that. That I mean, obviously, clients have the final say, but you try your very best to yeah. to guide people to. Hey, this is no. This is if we do it this way, you'll save yourself time and money. Your, your concrete guys are not going to charge you a fortune to farm the concrete because mm-hmm. they have to buy all this bespoke wood that they're going to chuck away, right? They're, they're mm-hmm. not going to. Yeah. Um, and then things like as simple as like door openings, having knowing that a rough opening of a door, right? That you have a wall that's you have a hallway that's thirty six inches, and at the other end you put a thirty six inch door. It's like. What? doesn't work it's so frustrating <laughs> the times like, I've, I've had those situations where you're yeah. trying to like custom frame some janky opening because the door is too big for the the width of the hall with the entry space that's right it's such so, a pain so knowing those things and trying to and, and accommodate that and then joist directions right you know it's mm-hmm. like well this might be the most efficient way to have a j- floor system for the production of the floor system mm-hmm. but the guy on site if we just twist this turn this and get rid of this beam all your sub trades are going to be so happy that they don't have yep. to drop out of a system to go over a beam or round a yep. beam. You know, yep. um, you're not going to have an electrician asking, can we drill through this engineered beam? Like, no, you can't drill yep. through that engineered beam. Yeah. Um, we had, we had a house we built had 10 foot ceilings in the walkout basement. And because there was no thought given to that and there was nowhere for all the mechanical stuff to run, we ended up dropping the entire ceiling of a big house a foot. Yeah. So it wow. turned into a nine foot ceiling over the entire place. Yeah, which right is the cost avoidable. of that, right? You know, it's yeah. totally avoidable. You, 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 you know, you, you, you don't. Ne- we did a house. Um, <laughs> it was so crazy, and it was this was, it was early into my construction career. It was one of the first houses that Nick and I did, and uh, the basement was a forest of posts mm. <laughs> just to carry all the beams and stuff that the the designer had put in. To you know, we had like so it was like six or seven posts and none of them in any kind of like made the basement completely unusable in the future because mm-hmm. you've just got these random posts in the middle of the floor mm-hmm. to carry wow. loads it's like man if we you know as a experienced person you look back and it's like man if just a few little changes and we could yeah. have yeah. taken care of a lot of that right so and and so on my plans i tend to maybe go a little further than i need to with regards to uh what to what needs to be produced but that's more to lead I try my very best to lead engineers, to lead um, floor designers, trust manufacturers, to lead them, um, not to do their job for them, but just to try and help, like for yep. the guy on site that's gonna get this floor system, if all his joists run in the same direction, is gonna be so much happier than getting halfway yeah. through a floor, and now we've got to switch directions, when my machine's gonna switch direction, mm-hmm. yeah. and I've got butt joints all over the place, so I've got this beam that kind of all of a sudden intersects halfway through to carry yeah. this load, um, mm. if we, you know, just, Try to do that in a in a. I, so I've tried to put all that on my plans to do mm-hmm. that. Same with the roof system, right? You know, we've all worked in roof systems where the, the trusses come and, and it's just and you know you go to <laughs> you go you go to you go to the average construction site after the house is built and there's a stack of trusses that wasn't used. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, I, I know some of our big developments. We had there was an architectural company that did all the design and they had multiple people drawing plans. Right. And so this is like a 230 lot subdivision and. We built the same house, you know, a few times in there. Right. But they had been drawn by a different person from the architectural firm. And so one roof was a cakewalk. The other one looked the same when we were done, but <laughs> but took us an extra four days. Right. Because wow. direct trust directions were stupid and it was just a hot mess. Yeah. And that's where there's a huge danger in in people giving their bid price on, mm-hmm. on a home. Huh. In that, well, if I'm going to give a bid price that's accurate, I want to see the floor package. I want to see the structurals for the foundation. I want to see the truss layout and truss package. Because if I'm just given a ballpark number of what it should be, I could be off by several days other direction, which is enough to lose your shirt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it makes a huge difference. So again, like that, that strategy you can um, build into your plans and that communication with the following trades it just makes the entire project way better, but there's gotta be good communication and mutual yeah. respect between everybody too. That's right, and I always try to, to get encourage clients to to once they've been, taken my plans and gone to, stru- if the structural engineer is required, um, to, to flip them back to me, even if a floor system, you know, they, they've gone and they've got a floor system permit package done, flip it back to me so that A, I can comment on what the design is and, and, exp- and touch base with the floor manufacturer to say, hey, the reason I went this way is because they have a furnace here and they want to run the stack up this way there's, yeah. there's things like that mm-hmm. um 
and similar with the engineer, right? That com either send comment back to the engineer, hey, if we could look at it from this direction, hopefully we can not have this beam here or we can mm -hmm. try and eliminate that. Um, and to transfer all that information back onto my plans. So um, when the guy on site opens up the architectural plans, mm -hmm. it has all the information. He doesn't have to open up the architecturals, see the foundation schedule, then go to the engineer schedule, which is completely different from that, mm -hmm. and then look at the floor system guy because he's put a pocket in to catch a beam over here mm -hmm. that nobody else yeah. has talked about, that nobody's yeah. communicated about that, right? Um, and discrepancies in measurements from one plan to the next. Yeah, I was just about to say, we did a house um, uh, over on a cart ride, and <laughs> the fl the foundation, floor system, and main floor were three different sizes, like what? ranging from like one foot shorter to a foot bigger to a three feet shorter. It was like, this is, you know, and and the guy on site, yeah, you can work around that, but it just shouldn't be the case. No. You know, the, the, we, everybody should be communicating to everybody else, but yeah. things get lost in translation. Yeah. Um, well, and people get pissed off. So I can think of many times where guys I worked for hated the either the engineer or hated the architect, and they were miserable. And every time they had their little meeting on site, there was all kinds of tension. Mm -hmm. But have you had any experience so far in being the designer, having situations where people were frustrated with you for your design? And I mean, mind you, most of that you would never know because the guys are just working away and yeah. freaking Craig. Well, I, I try my best to, again, <laughs> probably a little bit over involved, but I, I always, I'm always open for clients to give me a call. Hey, we're missing a measurement here, right? Things yeah. happen, right? Things like that. Um, I, I haven't, hmm, I haven't heard of anything, right? I'm sure, like you say, there, there are yeah. uh, situations like that. Um, I, I know that I have a good, I have a good relationship with all the professionals I work with, the engineers that I work with, they, they, they definitely, mm-hmm. I don't get comments. I get comments that I've missed something, which is pretty typical, right? Yeah. Um, oh, I've mislabeled something just because uh, <laughs> sometimes you copy and paste something to be, and then you want to go back and edit it because it's quicker just to edit a small portion of something you've already done. Yeah. And you forget to go back and edit it. Oh, um, yeah. Things like that. Um, but definitely, um, I haven't had anybody call me up and shouting at me that, they, that this has been screwed up or whatever, that, that they've missed the boat completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but it sounds like your intention to communicate and have that collaboration mm -hmm. means most of that won't happen. Like when we were framing, there, we had an interest in figuring out the trades that would follow us. You know, what could we do better? Mm -hmm. And you, you've, you're basically seeing your work, which in our case, you just do the framing. Okay, this my job ends here. Rather than just visualizing it as that kind of shallow, here's my job, you visualize it as the whole home and you go, okay, my part is a small part to play in a bigger picture. And then you're able to communicate with, with each other in a way that's really great. And you, you have a better, you actually have a better, I think, attitude toward the work because you feel like you're part of something bigger. Yeah. Rather than just your head down, I'm only the, doing the framing, everybody's bugging me. Uh, mm -hmm. I never have it right from this guy or that guy and you're just miserable. That way of working is stressful. The people working under the leaders who are thinking that way are stressed like I remember working for a guy who would just lose his shit on people, throwing sledgehammers and being outrageous because of frustrations with architects and so on. And then the yeah. laborer screws, you know, normal screw up. But their sense is so stressed out mm -hmm. versus a desire to collaborate with the other trades and build actual friendships over time. Yeah. yeah. That, that way of working is just so much more enjoyable and it's better as far as delivering a product that's, that's more... Um, thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, like when I was building in at the big sub subdivision, we were working with the same trades all the time. So it was a, it was a regular thing, especially kind of the front end of the subdivision and the early days, years of that, that build, um, that I would, I would go into homes we had finished and talk to everyone that followed us, mm -hmm. talk to the electrician, the plumber, the heating guy, the flooring guy, like I talked to all of them. Like, how has this been? You know, it's not just to get a pat in the back because it was so square and that things look so good. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you're you're satisfied with the work, but is there anything we could do when we're in the framing stage on the next few that would make it even better? Yeah. You know, like, well, if you want to get really nippy, you, you could do this. You could do this. You can make sure that, you know, these, these joists and studs line up and you add an extra cripple here or whatever it is. And for me, I'm like, 
that that is no extra work on my end. Yeah. As far as the material used, it just means more knowledge that I've I've got that I can then cater to the people that follow me, mm-hmm. make their job even better. And then that just builds your reputation. I mean, you're seen as someone who's teachable, who's humble, who's showing respect, and your end product, your quality is 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 better. So it's a yeah, it's such a benefit. Communication on 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 the sites is is huge, right? And and that idea that, like you say, that we're we're trying to build a product for the the end user, the client together, right? Mm-hmm. That but there's so there are so many times where you get locked into oh, I'm just framing, I don't care. Yes, yeah. this, this is what the plans say. I'm going to do it this yeah. way. It's like okay, yeah. but if you just do this slightly different, yeah, and and you're going to save somebody a little down the road, or, or speak up and communicate. Hey, if I just move this over six inches, mm-hmm. yeah, we might be able to do something here and make something that works for everybody, right? Or, yeah. or that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and and within the plans, so I'm definitely, like I say, I, I try to communicate with, I mean, there's there's obviously clients that I, that I never speak to again. I send the final drawings off and, mm-hmm. and that's gone and then that, that house gets built and I mm-hmm. don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I try not to that to be the case. I want to I want to be able to see the project. I want to be able to, I want to see the the end result, right? There's something pretty, pretty cool about seeing something that you've drawn on paper mm-hmm. is now standing in mm-hmm. 3D and in the real world, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't think of a time, not that I was really paying attention, but when an architect would come on the job site and go and so tour around. Just one, yeah. I'm not an architect. That's right. very, there's very strict rules about me calling myself an architect. I'm not yeah. an architect, I'm a building designer. So just, yeah. uh, So when the building designer comes <laughs> on site, uh, I don't remember thinking a, that was a normal thing. Like a building inspector would come, an engineer mm-hmm. would come, yep. and that was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea of having the designer mm-hmm. or architect come and actually be there on site sounds like a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, that was that was something that was really really rare. And I mean, the designers oftentimes aren't local, right? They're like right. those places being designed yeah, in Vancouver or something. But yeah. when there were there was a few local guys that I did use over the years, and I would have some sit downs with them. But it was actually on my initiative to go and sit and find mm. them. Like they weren't ones that would come to the site um, often at all on, on, of their own accord. Um, and but it's you, interesting too, cause like amongst the trades, I mean, the, the fairly true stereotype is that tradesmen are opinionated, <laughs> self-righteous, and they complain about everybody else. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it kind of stems from like a, a pretty heavy insecurity oftentimes. Um, and so to, to be the opposite instead and like look for ways that you can improve and communicate, it's better for everybody and it builds your reputation. So it's a really easy way to stand head and shoulders above everybody else, not because you're a superior person, but because you actually just end up with a better product because you communicate and you're willing to mm-hmm. to hash through the details. And be curious. Like totally. You know, you're I remember you being really curious about why an engineer would want it a certain way. Like tell yeah. me a little take a second to tell me about this. Yeah. But yeah. sadly it's like the different people involved in the job don't necessarily have that time because they're never thinking mm-hmm. about making space to talk to one of the other trades that are working on the same project as you to be able to learn from each other. Because I know, Craig, you've described situations where when you're designing something, like you're local here in Summerland, having a local designer, I would imagine, would be very beneficial because you know, for example, soil types and different things that can be prone to a certain area or hillside that you've designed a house before, you can know, okay, this this is going to potentially be an issue. That kind of stuff would be so helpful versus somebody way off in who knows where. And, and the municipality, right? Knowing knowing yeah. what the municipality itself, right? Because one of the cool, one of the craziest, cool and craziest things that's in the B- BC building code, which is what we work within, is that uh, pretty much at the end of every line that it states a fact, it then says, um, "Given juris- uh, uh, municipality and jurisdiction of authority." Right. So at the end of the day, no matter what this document says, right. Yeah. The jurisdiction having authority has yeah. the final say. So yeah. they, they can decide. So yes, in the building code, you can do this. We don't feel that it applies to this area because of this soil type. Yeah, right. Therefore, we want you to get an engineer to say that it does. Yeah. So um, knowing what the municipalities work and how they work and knowing your local area is great. And having that relationship, right, that hopefully, um, the, and not to say that this is the case, but a project comes across and it's got the... The, the Meadowview drafting logo on it. Yeah, they know. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. This is this is you know yep. we're going to have to check for the same things Craig leaves every time. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. 
<laughs> well, that and like you talked about that that curiosity. Yeah, that is is such a an asset. Um, again, with this, just thinking back to this foundation that I'm kind of assisting on uh, its assembly and how it's going together, and talking to these these friends of mine, these framers that are new to foundations. Um, there's a few things that I kind of brought up. And they're like these are here's a few things I would encourage you to talk to the engineer about when they come mm -hmm. down to do their inspection to inspect steel. Because I had a really good relationship with the engineer that I ended up working with primarily over all my years. And we built a, developed a great relationship where I could I could challenge them, I could ask mm -hmm. questions. And they weren't, it wasn't me challenging them because I didn't want to do the work. It's like, explain to me why you've engineered it this way. So I get why you've got steel in this location because I'm not quite seeing why you've asked for this. Yeah. And so a couple examples on this current one that I'm kind of assisting on, um, in this particular job, there's a retaining wall, a 12 foot tall retaining wall at the back of the house. So it's got a six inch on center, 15 M vertical dowels mm -hmm. on the tensile side of the wall. Mm -hmm. So on the back of the soil side. And then there's like a five foot, 18 inch deep footing toe on the inside, on the basement side. So I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm like, I'm not understanding why this is engineered this way. Like, what is the point of this giant footing in here? Um, and the steel is on the on the soil side of the wall. So I'm like, that means that's the tensile side. So that wall is basically, I realized after the fact, like I think what the engineer has done here, they've actually engineered this wall as a retaining wall and haven't given it any credit for having top support mm -hmm. so that this can actually be backfilled before the floor goes on. Yeah. So once I kind of thought through that, okay, that justifies the reality of this ridiculous footing and this huge grid of steel and I would have actually, if I'd seen this project before it actually got all approved and done, I would talk to the engineer and be like, okay, you've designed this huge footing in this, this incredibly engineered wall. What if we just put the floor on before we backfill? <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Now we don't need this giant footing. The steel goes on the inside of the wall and the, it's the grid is way in, less, yeah. like there's all these ways to look at it. And I'm like, these are questions worth asking because it makes the job way easier to build. And another one I'd mentioned to the guys that are down there, I'm like, so one thing I would ask the engineer, if you're gonna work with this guy again ever, is I see you guys have a big stack of corner bars here, two foot by two foot bent 15 M bars for all your corners. Um, see if he wants those and needs those on your interior corners. So the reason I say that is because if you've got a corner like this, you've got soil on the outside, this wall with the pressure of the soil pushing on, these two walls want to fall towards each other. So it provided the rebar in the walls is overlapped in the corners. The engineer that I used to work with, he wouldn't require us to put corner bars there mm -hmm. because those two walls are collapsing on one another. There's no, there's no tension in any, in any location there. Um, if the corner was this way and soil is pushing from this side to so an inside corner, then those two walls are pushing away from one another. So you absolutely need that's rebar right. corners there because that's under tension. So just understanding the forces being applied to the wall how the walls are functioning allows you to have an educated discussion with the inspector, the engineer, and by asking those questions and running them through the forces that are being incurred, not that you're doing all the, all the physics and the math that's included, yeah. but you're actually looking at it logically. When you ask those questions of the inspector and engineer, they're like, oh, this person's actually thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can actually, you know what? No, you don't need those. Next time we do a foundation, you don't need those corner bars. You know, yeah. in, in that location. And yeah, talk to me about that. If we're doing another house like this, we will do a smaller footing if I know you're going to put the floor on first. Like those things can save so much work. And then you end up with this like two-way discussion, solving problems together and an easier build, a better end product and everyone's happier and it's cost less. Yeah. Like that's win, win, win all the way around. Yeah, I was chatting with a, a newer contractor this week and just going through and just, again, educating on, on that idea of, uh, things being in, in under tension. There's the so there's there's not very many things that are under compression on a job site. If you actually when you get into it, right, the floor mm -hmm. system is a tension, the tensile system. The truss structure is a tensile system, right? Um, there's a reason that the trusses are referred to as top and bottom cord because those mm -hmm. two by fours could be replaced with a cable, supposedly, right? Right, because right. the, they work under tension, right? Not you know, um, so. Once you, once you learn that idea and aspect of what a wall system assembly works and how it works and why it's the way it is, you're right. You can have those educated conversations mm -hmm. and potentially save time and money for the client because, hey, you know what? This situation doesn't quite apply to this area, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, we've all worked on houses where you've done a, 
a retaining wall detail on a foundation wall because the first two feet of the house is covered with a slope and then immediately mm. slopes away and you've got no, and, uh, but for 20 feet, you've got this retaining wall detail that's, mm. you know, took time and energy and money and rebar to, to build, right? And it's actually only retaining a foot and a half of dirt yeah. for the first three percent yeah <laughs> and I, I would give just a little bit of context i was gonna say pushback but in regards to everything is under tension um absolutely true but it's also it's that it's that marrying of tension and compression right, right? because like we talk about an eye joist in a floor system yeah the bottom cord could be a cable it's under tension the top cord is under compression right you know they're 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 one is being pulled on the one's collapsing on itself which is why in an eye joist floor system you can cut the biggest holes in the middle yeah because that's where the loads are so isolated where the bottom cord is under tension the top is under compression and that the osb in the middle of the eye joist is is serving virtually no function whatsoever yeah and in a foundation wall it's the exact same thing if you have a wall that's this this thick and there's soil pushing from here and in this situation, there's no top support. The wall wants to fall over. You know, it's going to want to crack on this side. So that's where all the tension is. So the rebar mm -hmm. is in that side. Um, and the inside of the wall is under compression. It makes even more sense, easier to consider if you have top and bottom support. Now you have this beam, basically the wall running this way. Now, if you have top and bottom support, the rebar needs to be on the inside of the wall mm -hmm. because as the load is pushing here, this wall wants to bend this way mm -hmm. and if it's going to crack it's going to crack on the inside that's where the rebar goes understanding those loads uh, allows you to solve all these questions when you look at a plan like why is the rebar here what's the loading is this a full height wall is it is it got top or bottom support like you can start to think from the perspective of the engineer and answer a lot of your own questions yeah um i know we, we'd seen a video i don't know if this is in high school or or part of my apprenticeship where they actually showed this cool demo of that very concept and Concrete is phenomenal under compression mm -hmm. and it sucks under tension, which is why steel, which is amazing under tension and not as good under compression, is such a perfect union of the two because they totally support each other. And what they'd done in this little example is they had formed up this little concrete beam and it was basically size of like a two by four. And they had a piece of wire uh, run through it uh, close to one edge. So they first of all, they set up these two support blocks. They put this little concrete two by four across this these two bearing points and they put it so that the wire inside the concrete was at the as at the, was at the top and they started stacking weights on it and after like I don't know, 20 pounds of weight it broke right cracked well then they took that piece of concrete that was broken but the wire hadn't broken and they flipped it over so now it sat down and the crack closed because the wires at the bottom and they put like 200 pounds on it yeah and that wire was holding all that load the concrete is under compression it's like oh that's how that works. And like those simple bits of knowledge just give you so much uh, confidence. And when you look at plans, like I understand how this works. And if there's something that, that you see in a job site that you can't add up, then it's like, well, let me talk to the engineer. Yeah. Maybe they've copy and pasted another design to this project that they've actually over-engineered like crazy and isn't, isn't necessary, which then comes back to your design where you can, you can kind of marry all of the different elements of the build and simplify the whole thing because all of these different elements can work together. The floor is a big solid diaphragm that gives support to the tops of all the foundation walls. You know, I've had huge frustration with big tall walls on projects that engineers have had to design and because of wind loads and shear, they design these ridiculous walls. And I'm like, but there's a floor system that butts into this portion. There's like, it's got mid height support for all of this area. Like, yeah, but we don't, we don't account for that. Can you please? <laughs> Because that would make this whole thing way easier to build. If not, you have then say it's your name on it. Fine, I get that. But there's there's decisions worth or discussions worth having, and, and from comes, your possession, that's that's a huge advantage. And yeah, that comes down to again design and design with a little bit of experience. That just switching yeah. those joist directions. Now we're not we're now supporting that wall, right? You know, if we if our joists are going in parallel with that that wall that's under load, the engineer won't take those. Yeah, and engineers. Typically, engineers don't want to design things. They want to comment on a previous designed system, mm. right? So they're not going to tell you, I mean, a good engineer will mm -hmm. tell you, hey, if we switch these joists around, we're now butting against this wall. We're now transferring that load through the system as opposed to doing some kind of blocking, which we don't want to do, which is garbage. Yeah. We'll, just, <laughs> we'll just build a retaining wall. That's the easy route there, yeah. right? Yeah. We're switch the joist 90 degrees. We're now butting against that wall. We've put that glued and screwed that diaphragm on it. And now we've created a, a support system for that wall, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, 
like you say, you're on site dealing with the engineer. And sometimes if it's on the designer like myself, that's been lacking in their design and not shown a, a, a true representation of what's on site. That's mm -hmm. how you can end up with situations where you have a 20 foot retaining wall that's holding up 3% of the retaining, that's only 3% yeah. used as a retaining wall, you know, yeah. um, cause the engineer doesn't know, mm -hmm. can't answer that question. Yeah. This is what you're going to have to do to, cause if I don't know, you go to the top, right? You, 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 yeah. you max it out cause you don't want to have a situation. Um, sorry. And just to jump back the, to your, your, your example of tension and compression, um, the greatest way that I thought saw it was actually so um, the Sydney Opera House in in Australia, um, all those segments of concrete that you see are all independent and only held together with cables that run through them. Hmm. So you remember when you were a kid, you had the little giraffe that you'd squeeze the the yeah. bottom, yeah, it'd fall over, yeah. let go, and it'd stand back up. <laughs> yeah, that's the Sydney Opera House is designed in that manner. It's got cables running through it that that tie it all together, and that's exactly it's under tension and compression at the same time. Hmm. Yeah. they're working in forces together. Wow. Yeah. To, it makes it so much more fun to build stuff mm. when you're kind of considering the loads and the tension, the compression, how it's all functioning. And you're, you know, people look at trusses like, why are they the shape that, what are these, all these different components <laughs> in here? Like what a pain in the neck, all this bracing. Like, no, that's that bracing that you're having to add is so that as that part that's under compression, because there's all this, this huge span that's being, uh, being spanned across, we have to support those braces. So they don't collapse sideways. Yeah. You know, if they're if you if you overload that like crazy, where is it going to fail? Well, the top cord is going to want to wiggle. Well, it's held straight by the, the the OSB and the plywood on the roof for the plywood OSB, and then all the webs inside are under tension and compression in different ways and have to be supported so they don't collapse. Like then you start to be like, okay, this makes sense. And with that with that knowledge, you can then you know at times talk to designers and be like, well, can we deal with this in a different manner because what you've designed in is a huge pain in the neck, and can we do it in this other way that that saves cost and and it's so much more fun to build um and design it's it's mm -hmm. I, one of the cool things i enjoy about both the building aspect of when and the design is the problem solving is the client comes with their, their great ideas of what they want to see they send you like 17 pinterest boards yeah <laughs> um you know and i always tell i always tell clients that hey just the more information you can give me the better chance i'm going to be able to give you you know, um, I always laugh and joke as like, I'll do the first preliminary, you'll look at it, hate everything about it. But that tells me just as much about if you loved yeah. it, right? Because mm -hmm. I know where to go, where not to go. Um, we, we talked a little bit just before the podcast about today, which is March 8th, building code yes. has been changed a bit. And and uh, it's a pretty substantial change yeah. here, which has to do with seismic stuff yeah. and windows and corners and how much wall area like, can you explain that just a little bit because there's that kind of plays into some of this strategy and design that you're gonna have to start looking into and that us as builders will have to start actually being the hands on the, you know, the yeah. ground to deal with them yeah so um so yeah like you say as of march 8th today uh the bc building code has switched from the 2018 building code to the 2024 building code um so the seismic stuff has actually been delayed it's in the code um but it's been delayed till 2025 um because they just want to make sure that things are working out the way that they should do so in our area now we're we're having to look at seismic loads or, you know found, uh earthquakes things like that um which is all about lateral support so again going into that supporting thing right so a lot of designs happen where you have a beautiful view to the lake we are mm -hmm. blessed that we have this wonderful lake in our in our area and a lot of houses want to look at the lake so they basically the east wall is typically glass. <laughs> mm -hmm. So well, as does, much as possible, as much as possible. So what you've done though, is you've taken away, um, all the lateral support. So that house now is basically a, an open-ended box that could fall over. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so the new building code, um, I haven't delved super deep into it yet. Cause again, it's delayed. So I've got lots of things to be doing, mm -hmm. but it's going to be about location of windows to corners and things and making sure huh. that you're not taking away. And if you do want to take away, so where you could do that in the old building code, you could take away quite a large portion of that wall so that you could have a window still, as long as you stayed in with other parameters. Um, you will have to get a professional, an engineer involved sooner to, um, to, to be able to comment on that to, 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 if you wanted to have those bigger windows, yeah. look, taking advantage of that beautiful view um, so that you would wouldn't be stepping outside of the code and maybe building steel arches, mm -hmm. coming up with ways to, to laterally support, to give it that, shifting support so that it doesn't collapse left or right i think there's a um there's a great TikTok that was going around maybe 12 months ago 
of a a guy with a, a dozer just touching a house and the mm. whole thing collapsing because it had no wall sheeting on it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Wow. Well, that's what they're trying to avoid, right? Is that, you yeah. know, it's all great. So wall sheeting, the wall sheeting is a is, is, is an important aspect of the framing of the wall, mm. right? There's, there's an, a specific nailing pattern you've got to do on sheeting. You don't just put it up there so it holds the siding up. Mm -hmm. It's there to give that wall lateral that structural support so that it doesn't collapse. Yeah. Um, but then if you pepper that whole wall sheeting with windows, None left. Now you've yet. got none left. <laughs> so that's where I'm, I'm kind of, you know, my, my brain goes into like whether there, I'm sure there is already companies doing it, but like structural windows, right? you know, whether it's like the glass is, is somewhat structural and gives that lateral support, but then you've got like gaskets around it. So the glass kind of floats in the frame. So I'm mm. sure to what degree that's even possible or else like super over-engineered jams where the actual window liner and nailing flange is like five times the size and is like, you know, steel gusseted corners to create that lateral support in yeah. order to give the structure back that is lost by these big by a holes window. in the that's windows. Right. So like there's, that's a fascinating issue. And you know, the, the unfortunate thing is it just drives cost up because it's mm -hmm. more and more so the case that when the city inspector shows up and looks or looks at the plans, like I'm not comfortable with, with this, hire an engineer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes engineers like, well, if I'm engineering this, then I want to have my name on, I want to, I want to speak into these things as well and just costs go up and up and up and up. And like we talked about before too, um, you know, the building code was kind of originally designed around a seventies box basic house. A post war, yeah, a post war 900 square. We have them in our town, our lower town, you know, like downtown Penticton, uh, mm -hmm. Adams Avenue here in, mm -hmm. in Summerland. Um, those post war 900 square foot boxes Mm -hmm. Typically got green stucco with blue foundations painted. That's yeah. they all seem to have that same that <laughs> mm -hmm. same look, right? Um, and that's what the building code was spoken was designed to was for every man to build his castle, right? Mm -hmm. So it was very prescriptive. You're building a wall that's eight feet long, eight feet high, ten feet long, mm -hmm. with a six foot window in it. These are the members that you need in the wall. This mm -hmm. is the nail pattern you need to do for you. you yeah. You, um, so that's the original building code. Jump forward, you know, eighty years, and we're not anywhere near that building code yeah. anymore. We don't build that type of housing. There's very rarely do we build a square box of a house. You know, we have um, beautiful, modern, uh, heavily Scandinavian influenced designs, single pitch roofs, mm -hmm. um, uh, flat roofing, you know, just, just, and again, because of the, we live in such a beautiful area, everybody wants windows on every face, every wall. Mm -hmm. um, so then you're, you're trying to basically, you know, there's always additions and amendments to the mm -hmm. building code, but you're trying to, meld all those together to then in your plans like hopefully we don't need an engineer yeah but you've got to be very thoroughly educated on the building code Try what to parts be, yeah. apply to what areas to say that this is okay to hopefully when the inspector looks at it at application they say yep looks good and they don't say i want an engineer and yeah. then here just and, and cite that on the plans right so you know you try your best to to reference on the plans if you're doing something you reference this is part of this is um this is from BCBC 9.10.1.14. You know, yeah, <laughs> it just, addresses that particular, and it addresses that particular situation, right? You know, I want yeah. to put a window here and we're allowed to do a window here because of, yeah. um, you know, and you try to, your best, and again, not perfect at it, but you try your best to, to give that information because like you say, if a building inspector gets the whiff of a question, yeah, it's immediate because the liability is removed from them and put on to the professional at that yeah. point, right? So... Make it as easy for them as you can. That's right. To give them as much information, right? So you got, um, so I often wonder, and I've spoken to other contractors, but nobody, again, cost is a big thing, but it would be really great. You know, you, you, you give a set of plans that are for the permit application. And then I draw up a whole nother set of plans that deletes a bunch of stuff that's not needed for the construction application. Cause mm. we, you know, we've all worked on plans that look great. And they have lovely pictures of plants and chairs and people sat in them and yeah. everything. Yeah. But because of all these lovely pictures, <laughs> I can't see the numbers that the walls are. Yeah. How many of us who've built have made mistakes because the plans are just way too complex? Yeah. Like, get rid of all this extra junk. I don't need all of that. So give a me set of plans, plans for on site. That's yeah. right. A set of plans for on site that ditch the, the lovely pictures of people sat on chairs drinking yeah. coffee. Yeah. yeah. And we just have actual information <laughs> that's required, you know, a blueprint yeah. that's required, right? You know, um, that's no different. From the permit plans yeah. but is stripped down hey you're the framer here's a set of framing plans for you it's just got yeah. the walls on it it's got the locations you need to make sure this is happening yeah but 
you don't care. Well, I mean, I, I've built houses that had great plans that were fairly straightforward that maybe had like five pages. And mm. I've built high-end customs where it's like the architecturals has got 20 pages and then you've got the structurals that has 50. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you spend so much time just cross-referencing cross all the details to try and not miss anything because it's so critical. Yeah. You know, like there's there's a happy medium in there somewhere. There's, there's got to be like, so my average plane, uh, page count is in the 16, 15 to 16, 16 17 kind of page count. But for a framer on site, typically it's page five, six, and seven they need, you know, foundation, mm -hmm. floor layout, upper floor. Yeah. And then that's it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Usually uh, I would pull those few pages out. Yeah. And the rest I keep in the trailer. Yeah. And if I needed some other information, like, oh, what is it? I need to see the window height or figure something else out. You'll yeah. reference that. But for the most part, yeah, give me, we'd laminate them sometimes too. Yeah. You know, so we got a the set that can be out on the floor. Um, well, that's, that's great. I mean, that, that I think gives our audience and, uh, and people watching and listening, um, kind of a good all around perspective on, you know, the things that are important to take into account, the value of communicating with the other trades that you're going to interact with the value and curiosity and discussion. Um, that's great. And it's so awesome to hear kind of your side of things, having been on the tools yeah. and your experience on site and then moving forward. And yeah, with the new building code stuff, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because every time this happens, you talk to the builders and everyone rolls their eyes. Yeah. Like, oh boy, what's it going to be? And, and the homeowners at the end of the day, what's the, what kind of cost is this going to incur to Sadly, them? Sadly, yeah. Right. And trying to be on the, the cutting edge of that to iron out those details as efficiently as possible in the most um, cost effective ways possible. It's, it's exciting mm -hmm. um, and a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. The building code, I mean, is a thick document. You know, um, I, I, as a residential building designer, I, I work primarily with what we refer to as part nine. Um, it, it does step out into other parts when you reference in certain things, when you're dealing with fire codes and things like that. But mm -hmm. primarily I work within part nine, but it's a, still a, a robust document that's mm -hmm. quite thick and to memorize it all is, is crazy. And nobody expects that. And that's one thing you go, um, you, the communication is huge because nobody expects everybody to know everything. And yeah. you, you go to the, you go to the, the, the municipalities, the jurisdiction, uh, the d districts that are in the cities and they're, they're looking at something again for the first time, right? Because, yeah, they've, they've looked at 20 plans this last month, but not all have been the same. Mm -hmm. Not all have referenced the same part, parts of the code. And, you know, it's all about interpretation, right? It's definitely yeah. an interpretation situation. And, and that's where communication and um, there's a, things that's quite often said is like it's not to the letter of the code, but it's in the spirit of the code. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. something that you try to, right? It's like, yeah, okay, well, the code doesn't directly speak to this because this is never thought that this would ever be built under this code. Mm -hmm. But if we stay, we know what we're trying to achieve. And that's where some of the codes go into that way. Like the, the um, efficiency of a house has gone less. It's not so much prescriptive anymore. It's more in results based, right? So they've moved away from um, you have a, an exterior wall that has an R20 bat insulation in it. Now, you can still have an exterior wall with an R20 bat insulation in it. But you have to show you're working out. You have to figure, tell the people, well, because we have this um, heating system in there that's this high efficient heating system, it, this is why we can do that. Now, if you don't have a high efficient heating system, you can up your R value. Mm -hmm. and gives you better things. But it's not a prescriptive situation anymore. It's a results mm -hmm. base. And yeah. you pay somebody to do the math on figuring out, this is what you're telling me you want. This is the level that you can meet and reach step three is what we yeah. refer to. Eliminate right. windows on self-facing walls and add them in this location. That's like right. All those modeling uh, yeah. adjustments to make. Well, yeah. one thing that has always bugged me about the whole process of you have a code and these are the people in charge and you have all these gatekeepers mm -hmm. and me as a homeowner builder wanting to do, my personality is I want to do a good job. So tell me how I'm supposed to do it because I don't want to make a mistake and do it wrong. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when it came time for me to build my deck on my house, I went in to see the building inspector to just say, here's here's what I'm thinking of doing, you know, any issues that you can foresee. And he'd already approved everything from the drawings, but I wanted to go in and just confirm. And he more or less said, you need to get out of here, go build your deck. And didn't want me to ask too many questions mm -hmm. because as soon as you ask a certain kind of question that's going to mean more money yeah. potentially and so now i'm looking at doing a renovation on my garage 
and working with the building inspector on the uh, size of the water line coming in from the city into my house. And since it's going to be a, an additional suite, it you, you know the question is, do you need to go from three quarter inch to one inch to service that much water to the house? Mm -hmm. But he, I'm asking him, I'm like, I know you don't put a quote out for this type of work, but is, am I looking at 1000 bucks or 10,000 bucks? He's like, yeah, more around 10 pr probably. And so you, you know, you have these instances in a building project where you really need to know, and you really, you know, it could be a real severe problem if you don't do it properly. And then you have stuff that's not really that big of a deal. Just build your deck. And I, what I would love is man, if we could all just like, you know, collaborate more. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a, if I'm working on a project and I'm curious, like I want to know w why you want me to do it this way, let's work it out without everybody panicking about, oh, it's going to be this much more money or the engineer has just decided now because he can, he has the power to do it. Stamp, you have to do it this way, which I've had to deal with before. Now I got to do this totally ridiculous thing that doesn't, seem to make any sense to anyone else I talk to, but I just got to do it now because he says, and he's screwed off to who knows where and doesn't care anymore. So how in the midst of all of these different people trying to get the project done in a way that is good, proper, with all those gatekeepers, it feels like if one gatekeeper is grouchy and just <laughs> is sick and tired of all the nonsense, they can ruin it for everybody. Yeah. Or if you have a framer who doesn't, give a rip and they're just like no i'm just doing my job leave me alone a to b over yeah how can you collaborate better to be able to actually solve the issues before they become a problem mm -hmm. which is my interest right and i want to do the deck properly maybe there's an issue i can't think of but then because of the bureaucracy of it it's like get out of here just go build the deck yeah and that part is hard for me because i I, I know I'm here because I want to do it right. And if I have to, you know, take some extra time or spend a little bit extra money, great. That's fine. I want to do it right. Yeah. So help me. But that's, I find that part difficult. I think it comes, and this, and I'm not just saying that because it's it's me, but uh, <laughs> it comes down to the designer, right? Because so yeah. one of the things is that um, municipalities, just uh, uh, districts and cities don't want to tell you how to build your deck. Right? Yeah. They want to comment on what you're telling them you're going to do. Right. Um, engineers don't want to design your house for you. They want to comment on the house that you had designed. Yeah. Um, geotechs don't want to design your house for you. They want to comment on how you've, so all these things. So it all comes back down to the designer hmm. and having a designer that has some knowledge and experience that can, again, in the, having a local designer that can see the pitfalls, that can see the municipality that, oh yeah, yeah. I know that in Summerland, you're going to upsize your sweet count. You're going to have to upsize your water line from a three quarter inch copper to a one inch PEX. Yeah. Um, which is silly because once it gets back to the mains, it's still three quarter inch copper. But for that <laughs> 20 feet on your, for that 20 feet on your property, we, we have gone back up to one inch. Yeah. Um, Come on. Uh, but yeah, you know, so and knowing that, so that those, so having a good designer and somebody and a good contractor too, who's worked in the area, right. Mm -hmm. um, they can all comment on that and start the design off on the right foot that, Hey, this is the pitfall. If you're going to do your deck, this is great that you're going to do your deck. But if you build it this way, you're going to cause yourself to in, incur more costs because they're not going to like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so they don't want to design. These people don't want to design your project. They want to comment on a design. Um, yeah. So it's it's that having that that good designer in place, and there's lots of them in town. There's tons of good people working in town. But that's a good point. Like I don't have any experience other than drawing my own plans for my house in design mm -hmm. in the, in the construction world, but I have tons of experience designing branding, which isn't the same, doesn't have this necessarily the same types of implications, but if in graphic design and trying to design a logo for somebody, if I don't ask the right questions, like mm -hmm. you just talked about your deck and here's the implications of where that leads and where that leads. If I don't ask the right questions about, you know, how does this particular color and this particular font make you feel? And how do you think this makes your ideal client feel? And what's the story do you think you're trying to tell here that people are going to interpret? And all those types of questions, if I don't ask those questions, then inevitably I'm just creating another regurg regurgitated thing of whatever looks cool at the time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be sick of it and it's meaningless. 
But I've had situations with customers where I've spent two hours chatting with them and they finish and they're like, man, that just felt like a counseling session <laughs> where they're really thinking like, what are my core values about my business? And why did I start this in the first place? Mm -hmm. And what really inspires me and who are the types of customers that I love having and why? And they're just, after that, they just feel so excited about their business. They're so excited to get going and to be able to design now with color and shape and the way you do the curves and it, it all is communicating something. Mm -hmm. It's all part of a bigger job. And to be able to design well, like just hearing you describe it, the role of a designer is actually extraordinarily important. Mm -hmm. And a good designer really cares for people well, communicates well, and everybody else involved in the relationship that that designer facilitates suddenly experience something they may never logically connect. Yeah, Like when I'm able to design a logo that a customer just falls in love with and it means something to them, the person that walks into the coffee shop may not ever care or register that this is why we did that. But it's communicating a message that gives the owner longevity and they're telling a story slowly over time with how they do their bookkeeping, how they do their work with their employees and their HR, how they set up the, the, the space the aesthetics of the space it's all interconnected with what you're expressing a whole story and so that role of a designer is so fascinating to me because you could just skip over it and be like here's your generic whatever's trendy at the time like luke mentioned you know scandinavian or modern whatever country cottage whatever the term is anymore yeah that people are super into you could just go here meh, done or you could talk through those things like you're mentioning and, that, I, and I do that as well. I, a similar situation. I, I when I, a new client comes to me, it's a, a sit down conversation about, hey, so why are we doing this? What's your goal? Because yeah. so many people, especially with the renovations, um, the goal starts out here. And by the time they get to me, because they've spoken to 17 contractors, yeah. who have told them, go bigger, go better, go this, go do this. <laughs> yeah. They're over here. And it's like, what are, yeah. you, what, what are you trying to attain? It's like, yeah. well, we just wanted somewhere to feed the dogs. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, we can do that. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like th yeah. that's what we can, we can get there and we can make it beautiful. We can do an awesome job of that. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's get to where you're at. Right. And I've talked to myself, I've spoken to people and taught myself out of so much work. I uh, did it about a week ago. Uh, we were, I was meeting with a, a, a couple of clients that wanted to, um, in their mind, do a duplex. They're, they're from the States. The vernacular that they knew was duplex. Yeah. So I was like, wow, that's a, Okay, you want to turn a house into a two-story duplex or top and bottom stack duplex. Okay, that's we're talking like building code issues, all kinds of things right mm -hmm. now. So I went and had a you know an hour and a half meeting with them, and what actually ended up happening? They need somewhere for family to stay when they get there. <laughs> you don't so, need a duplex. You don't need no. a duplex for this. And but you know, and I ended up losing thousands of dollars worth of work from talking to them, saying, "You guys don't need to do this. We can do this," and because. Hey, you, yeah. we'll, we'll just build you a bedroom on the back or we'll just convert this, you know, 400 square foot laundry room I have here into a bedroom, you know, yeah. and like, you know, things like that. And it's all because <laughs> it's about the end product, the client yeah. and giving them those things. And like you say, sitting down and talking to people, communicating yes. where they're at, what they need, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Craig, mm -hmm. for, uh, for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in the area, need something designed. What was your company called again? Uh, Meadowview Drafting. And Meadowview Design. Drafting. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Dustin, for uh, co-hosting and helping me out. Thanks for watching and listening. Uh, we'll catch you again next time. Thanks.